1908. This came 1906. Last week, we talked about the signs and symptoms of a heart attack. This week, we're going to dive straight into it. We're actually going to talk about CPR. Cardiopulmonary resuscitation is what CPR is. And when it comes to that, you're talking about chest compressions, airway, and breathing. By the end of this lecture, we're going to be able to do four things. First, we'll be able to identify and list the sequence of CPR. Second, we'll be able to explain the procedures for performing CPR. Third, actually demonstrate it so you're going to see how to actually correctly conduct CPR. And then fourth, know when to actually terminate, because that's one of the biggest things. People think, well, if I start CPR, I can't stop. There's cases where that is true. However, there are cases where you're doing CPR and it's not benefiting anymore. You should just stop. And we're going to actually dive into that. CPR, like stated before, stands for cardiopulmonary resuscitation. It's truly a life-saving technique that is useful in many emergencies, such as a heart attack or near drowning. Because you've seen this a lot going to the swimming pool or in the ocean, there's a near drowning. And you have the lifeguards that help with that. Now, in this case, if it's a near drowning or something of that nature, they stop breathing or their heart stops. So, yes, CPR is definitely necessary. Did you know? Very interesting. CPR, like we say, is a life-saving technique and is used to keep oxygen-rich blood flowing throughout the body to the vital organs, such as the brain and the heart, the liver and things of that nature until emergency medical treatment is able to come up, uh, arrive. So we're talking about you're pushing or you're pumping on that heart to help circulate the blood and you're putting oxygen-rich blood through the brain. So again, if you take a look, through the brain. So as you pump it on the heart here, you're pushing the blood through the brain as well as the heart, the kidneys, the lungs, and so forth. So it's keeping those alive or keeping them oxygenated until other means of emergency care is actually able to take over. When the heart stops, the body no longer gets that blood. And because of that, there are chances or cases of um, that client or that patient suffering brain damage. So again, the lack of oxygen-rich blood can cause brain damage in only a few minutes. If you are untrained or have immediate access to a phone, call 911 or your local emergency number. Because again, 911 in America, but in other countries, it's going to be different. Call 911 before you even begin CPR. Because once you start CPR, it's going to be definitely difficult to stop. So again, call 911 first and then begin CPR. Even if you don't know CPR, you call 911, put it on speaker. The dispatcher would instruct you step by step until advanced health actually, advanced help actually arrives. Steps for CPR. Back in the day, I'm sure my age now, well, back in the day, it was airway, breathing, circulation. Now it's changed to CAB, compression, airway, breathing. So CPR, like we said, stands for CAB. Chest compression, 30 times. So again, it's what we'll call a 30 to 2. Your chest compression, 30 times, two breaths. So again, when doing chest compressions, you place two hands center of the chest and you push hard around three centimeters. We like to say around two, around two inches deep, around three centimeters. You want to push fast for 100 to 100 or 100 to 120 beats per minute. Then you have your airway. It's what we call the head, tilt, chin lift. If there is no spinal injury or, if you know, there's no head injury or no, no, no injury to the neck at all, do a head, tilt, chin lift. By doing this, you're opening the airway. In addition to that, you're also able to see if there's any obstruction in the airway. And if there is, you can do a quick finger sweep to try to scoop it out. Breathing. When breathing, like we said before and previously, when we talk about heart attacks, people don't want to go mouth to mouth, which is understandable with all the diseases coming about. But you should have a pocket mask. If you have a pocket mask or a bag valve mask, this is how you can actually provide artificial breath. And when doing that, it is a slow breath, just enough for that rise, uh, for that chest to rise and fall. You don't want to, it's not like you're blowing up a balloon where you blow, blow, blow and like it to pop. You're blowing up so you can see that chest rise and fall. So again, the steps for CPR is cab, compression, airway, breathing. Pushing down at least two inches allows for the heart to be squeezed and blood to move out. Now when it comes to CPR, get help. So these are the signs. Get help. Call 911. Get an AED if you can't get an AED. We're going to talk about that next Medical Monday. Then signs of life. Is there a response? Abnormal breathing. Perform CPR. Then you do your cab. Compressions, airway, and breaths. Notice at the bottom here. Repeat the cycles of 30 breaths and two ventilations until helps arrives. One thing in particular, 
is when doing CPR, again, you're going to be so nervous, but you want to make sure you're doing it correctly. And another thing is you're going to have such a large adrenaline pushing you that you're not going to realize you're actually tired. If you're tired when doing CPR, please tap out with somebody if there's help available. If there's not help, just keep pushing until helps arrive. Why CPR? CPR provides circulation of blood to the brain and the oxygen, so it provides that oxygen-rich blood to the vital organs like we said before. Now, we said if CPR is not conducted, breathing stops, there is no oxygen getting to the brain, brain damage can actually occur within the first few minutes. Like four or five minutes, brain damage can occur, and this will call reversible, which means after a while, the brain cells build back up and then you're good to go. However, irreversible brain damage can occur or brain death, because again, these are muscles. If there's no oxygen there. Brain damage or brain death can occur within eight to 10 minutes. So again, if somebody, um, what we call somebody had a cardiac emergency or cardiac arrest and is unknown downtime, it is hard to tell how long they've been down. Just go ahead and start CPR. Recognition. Early recognition of car uh, cardiac arrest is a key step in initiating early treatment. Again, that's why we talked about the signs and symptoms of a heart attack, you are able to recognize if they're going to, if they're having a heart attack and to try to get them treatment prior to them going into cardiac arrest. If you witness a person collapse or go into cardiac arrest or somebody becomes unresponsive, the first thing you want to do is what we call scene safety. So again, if you see somebody go down, you don't want to rush to the scene. You want to make sure you look around first because let's say somebody passed out in the middle of a road in, in an intersection. You're looking at getting ran over by a car. So instead of having one patient, you now have two, which is not good. So you want to assess the area first, make sure it's safe. And if it's safe, then you come to the person, tap them on the shoulder. Hey, hey, are you OK? If there's no response, look to somebody. You call 911. You go get help. Uh, I'm sorry. You call 911. You go get the AED. Then you call what we do. Look, listen and feel. You look for chest rise and fall. You listen for their breathing and you feel for any breath. You do that for about five to 10 seconds. If there's none of that that's actually occurring, check for a pulse in a carotid artery on the left side or right side. Performing CPR accomplishes two critical things. One, compressions move oxygenated blood to the brain to keep the brain alive. And two, compressions keep blood and oxygen moving to the heart muscle itself so that it has the best chance of resuming a normal electrical rhythm after a shock is delivered. Very interesting facts. About 9 in 10 people who have cardiac arrest outside the hospital die. And that's because, again, unknown downtime. So 9 in 10 people who go into cardiac arrest outside of the hospital die. Because, again, think about it. If you're in a hospital, you go into cardiac arrest, you're already on a hot monitor. So they get immediate care. However, Outside of the hospital, there is no heart monitor, so there's an unknown downtime. Did you know many fire departments implemented rules for termination of resuscitation? That includes providing at least 20 minutes of CPR on the scene. So what they're saying is, a uh, perfect, uh, perfect example would be me. Um, as a paramedic, we go up on calls, and there's always an unknown downtime of how long that person been down or have had um, cardiac arrest or something of that nature. So we get there, and if they're still called warm, and we hate to say it like that, but if they're still warm, we go ahead and initiate CPR, follow the a ACLS um, protocol. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, advanced cardiac life support, sorry. Uh, ACLS protocol. Then we go through those measures. However, if we get there and they're cold, that means they've been dead for a while. There's no sense initiating CPR because rigor has set in. So, again, that's one thing that's very unique. So a lot of times when you go on call or you see somebody, you're like, well, why the fire department or the paramedics didn't keep C doing CPR? After 20 minutes, you confirm they are um, confirm if it's viable, if they have a viable rhythm in three or four leads. And if not, we call med uh, our medical directors and say, hey, unknown downtime. This is what we've done. They will let us know, hey, keep going CPR or terminate CPR. So a lot of times you hear um, dead on arrival or dead on scene. That's why we called it on scene. Now, one thing is very unique. Rib fractures. If you ain't cracking, you ain't doing it right. I hate to be honest about it, but that's what it is. The incident of rib fractures after CPR report is reported in 70% of cases, which means about 7.6 broken ribs per person. 
So if that person is conducting CPR correctly, you're going to crack ribs. I hate to say it like that. I hate to be blunt, but it's true. Well, my very first call as paramedic did CPR. Lady was, I think, 75 or 80 years old, somewhere around there. Never done CPR on a patient before. I've always done on a medic and never done on a patient. When I say it sounded gross, it was ridiculous. If you ever had a chicken bone and just crack it in half, that's what it sounds like when doing CPR. And you're pushing down two inches to try to get that blood circulating. You're going to crack ribs. And to be honest with you, if me on the other end and I'm the one that went in cardiac arrest, I'd rather, I'd rather have cracked ribs than be, wake up dead or what we call being dead. Again, I really crack some ribs and I come around because ribs will heal. Death will not. So again, break a, few, break a few ribs. It is what it is, but you're saving a life. Now, once you take the responsibility of a volunteer rescuer, I mean, once you start CPR, you cannot simply just stop because you don't feel like it. You are covered under the Good Samaritan law. However, once you initiate care, you must follow through care unless you have somebody with the same level of training or more training that you could transfer a care. However, once you start it, you can't say, oh, I don't like them and get up and leave. You can't do it because then they can get you for negligence. It could be a misdemeanor, federal offense, depending on who it is and you know how the judges are and how courts are going and things of that nature. So again, once you start, you don't stop. Let's say you heard a loud bang outside. Arrgh, boom. Then you see this in your backyard. What would you do? What is the first thing you would do? Would you just run out there and check on them? Or what exactly would you do? First thing first, seeing safe. Notice what's happening. Notice that they crash through that privacy fence. Notice the wood all around. Make sure there's no um, down. Uh, falling down power lines and make sure there's no integrity damage to the tree. Cause again, I hate for there to be a second patient. So again, seeing safety is our biggest thing. Even if there's an accident, look around first, make sure it's okay. That's the same thing like crossing the street. You look first before you cross. You don't just cross and wish for the best. So you look first before you cross, before you begin CPR. These are the things you do. So it's like a checklist. If you notice on the right side, Seeing safe, PPEs. PPE stands for personal protective equipment. So it could be gloves, a pocket mask, or something of that nature. Is the patient conscious or unconscious? Call 911, get an AED, perform cab, compression. And then what did the other two? Y'all know? Airway and breathing. There you go. So here you go. Is the environment safe for the person? Is the person conscious or unconscious? If the person appears, so if you take a look at this third bullet, if the person appears unconscious, tap them. Hey, hey, are you okay? But say it loud in their ear because honestly, they could be drunk. You don't know. So say it loud in their ear. If the person doesn't respond and you're with another person, ask them or tell them to call 911 or whatever the local, the local emergency number is and get an AED. Now, the thing is, AED is now more prominent than before. So if you have big sports ring, things of that nature, AED is all around. Also, have somebody begin CPR. You want to start CPR as soon as possible. If you are alone and you have e immediate access to a phone, put that, sp uh, put that phone on speaker, call 911, begin CPR. Somebody else finally comes around, um, ask them to get the AED, AED. Sorry. As soon as that AED arrives, Begin setting up the AED. And we're going to talk about the AED next Medical Monday on how to actually set it up. Here I need the AED. And CPR, victims are divided into three categories. Your categories are adults, children, and infants. Now for adults, involve all adults and children who reach puberty. Children, victims from the age of one to puberty. And then you have your infants, involves victims with less than one year of age. So notice the key word here, we said it twice, the word puberty. What exactly or how is puberty defined by the American Heart Association? Puberty is defined as chest or underarm hair. So chest or hair on the chest or developed chest or hair under the arms for males, breast development for females. So again, 
We know females enter puberty at an earlier at an earlier age. So if they begin to develop breasts, they're considered hitting puberty. Then you're looking at two inches for that chest compression. For males, we we're slow boomers. That's where we are. We move slow on everything. And then some of us act slow. Me too, sometimes. But again, when it comes to that, if it's a developed chest, um, developed chest or developed muscles, Adam's apple, something of that nature, they have interpuberty. So again, divided in three categories, adult, children, and infants. So when it comes to the American Heart Association, you have what we call the untrained, the trained and ready to go, and the trained but rusty. Which one do you fall in? Are you the untrained? You don't know anything about CPR. Are you the one that's trained and ready to go? I mean, you recertify every two years. And in addition to that, you keep up to date with the latest. Are you one of those you trained, but you're rusty at it? Again, this applies to the situation which the adult children or infants need CPR, but again, not newborns. Infants up to four weeks old. Now, for those that are untrained, if you're not trained to CPR or worried about giving breaths, then provide hands-only CPR. I'd rather have just chest compressions than nothing at all. And notice what they talked about here. That means uninterrupted, uninterrupted chest compressions, 100, 120 beats per minute until the medics arrive. You don't have to do rescue breathing if you're not comfortable. Now, trained and ready. If you're well-trained and confident in your ability, check for that pulse. Check for that breathing. Look, listen, and feel. Five to ten seconds. You notice nothing's there, no response. Begin a chest compression. 30 breaths to every two, I'm sorry, 30 compressions to every two breaths. Then you have those trained but rusty. If you previously received CPR, cert, uh, real CPR training, but you're not confident in your ability, again, go with the, go to right of the untrained. Just do the chest compressions. If you're not comfortable doing the rescue breaths, that's 30 to two. Just do the chest compressions. I'd rather you do that than nothing at all. Notice we've always talked about chest compression, chest compression. So what exactly do we mean? Up here on the top left, this is what we're referring to for chest compressions. Notice for an adult, two hands, press down, two inches. For a child, one hand, notice the heel of that hand is being pressed down, two inches. Then for an infant, two fingers, press down, one and a half. Again, 30 chest compressions at a rate of 100 beats per minute, letting making sure that chest will rise and fall. On the right side, again, that's just repeating what we said before. Place one, place one of your hands on top of the other and clasp them together with the heel of the, with the heel of the hands and straight elbows. Push down hard and fast in the center of the chest, slightly below the nipples. Push at least two inches deep. Compress their chest at a rate of at least 100 to 120 beats per minute. Let the chest fully rise and fall between compressions. So remember, the key purpose of delivering compressions is to keep oxygenated blood moving within the heart and up to the brain to keep the brain alive. So the first thing I'm going to do is check for signs of breathing. Just checking the baby's pulse. Okay. Good. When can you stop CPR? When do you do it? Because again, people are like, well, if I start, can I stop? Yes, you can stop. But when does that occur? This occurs effective spontaneous circulation and ventilation. Care is transferred to another trained person. Physicians assume responsibility. Transfer of care to EMS. So again, as you're doing CPR, EMS arrives, you keep doing it until EMS come to you and say, hey, we got it from here. So once they say they got it from there, Step back. They got it. Obvious death is recognized. So again, if it's a decapitation, there's no sense in doing CPR because the blood's just going to squirt out the head. So again, or out the neck, I should say. So again, make sure you notice what's going on. If it's obvious death, if rigor set in, rigor mortis set in, that means they're stiff as a board. You don't need to do CPR because that's an unknown downtime. And lastly, when you stop CPR, if you're too exhausted to continue or if continuing CPR would put or place people in danger. If you're in the middle of the road and you're doing CPR in a car coming, stop CPR, move out the way. If you can drag the body, drag the body. If you can't, leave the body there, but get out the way. Rather have one victim instead of two victims. In summary, we're able to identify and list the sequence of CPR. 
we're able to explain the procedures for, for performing CPR. We're able to demonstrate CPR. And now we know when to actually terminate CPR. So with this said, you should be very comfortable with this. Now understand this is all a lecture. This is not your hands-on. This does not give you truly certified for CPR. It's all for general information. I highly recommend if you're not certified or you're thinking about certified or if you need a refresher, refresh or you need to become certified, find a local instructor, certified instructor. Again, American Heart Association. Google it for CPR classes, then you'll know where to go. I highly recommend because, again, like I said before pre previously, it's better to have it than not need it than to need it and not have it. Next up, we're going to talk about an AED, which is known as an automated external defibrillator. We're going to talk about what an AED is and actually how to properly use an AED. So with that said, hopefully you were able to learn some things today when it came to CPR. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comment section. Again, this is Kane 1906, sounding off. <laughs>